Hello and welcome to the bonus podcast for episode 457 of Conversation Street. I am Michael, I'm she Gemma. is Gemma, Gemma, and we are here today to talk about a classic character for our classic character profile. It's Valentine's week, everybody, so who better to have than an old romantic? It is Phyllis <laughs> Pierce. What an iconic Coronation Street character this is, and, I, and one who I can't believe it's taken us 457 episodes to get him around to profiling. I absolutely love Phyllis Pierce, and she's a character who, um, for you, I suppose, it's, it's been a, a recent addition to your Corrie knowledge banks, isn't she? Mm-hmm. Because uh, we've been watching the old episodes, and she first appeared on the show in 82, I suppose. And I think the thing with Phyllis is as brilliant as she was and as as well loved as she is i don't think that lots of people have got very many um memories of what she did because she didn't have any stories did she she was she was definitely like a kind of local color person you know <laughs> yes and that color was very lavender, shades of blue yeah. and lavender and lilac yeah. yeah 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 she she was literally for the, for the most of her time at coronation street she was there to you know prop up the bar in the Rovers, pint of Guinness, chase after Percy. Sexually harass Percy. Se- se- yeah, maybe maybe if it was made these days, you think um, of Phyllis as a bit different. Still, they would still pest. write it the same, but um, it wouldn't be an issues-based story because then definitely she'd have to go to... She'd have to at least go to, like, community service <laughs> and, like, not be allowed to be within 50 feet of him. <laughs> I mean, she joins Coronation Street, Jill Summers, in, well, at the age of... 72, I think it was. Bloody so, hell. I mean, this is, this was late in her life when she... I mean, she had been... She had an incredible life history up until this point. But uh, I think Phyllis is probably what she's going to be most remembered for. And it so just you, goes to show. I was looking up pension stuff the other day and it was like, when do you, what age do you want to retire at? And I can't remember what age it is that I'm going to have to retire at to be able to have any money whatsoever. But it certainly was around quite a high number. And I was thinking when I was doing it, like... How, what am I even going to be able to do when I'm now? I'm, I'm useless as it is. There you go. All, what all you need to do Curry. is... Yeah, John Curry is a randy grandma like Phyllis. Why not? Uh, uh, become a beloved battle See, she's not really a battle axe, is she? she no, not in that She's not no at way. all in the same vein. She's totally chill. As, she's... as the likes of Evelyn or, or Blanche or anything. And it's weird how chill she is, considering that she seems to be extremely sexually frustrated. <laughs> she is. I mean, you get them with their blue balls. And with Phyllis, it's just the blue rinse. <laughs> <laughs> right um now a lot of the information in this uh profile this evening well this evening i'm recording i don't know when you're listening to it comes um partly from Coropedia, as always but also um from phyllis's no sorry jill summer's autobiography um which was called um i could open your eyes the story of jill summer's and i want to say a massive massive thank you to um Corrie's very own adam bleese silent dirk in the factory for um, giving us a few pages from this to get some um, some juicy tidbits and um, and really just help us with some of what Phil has got up to on the street. Um, now this this autobiography was named after a um, uh, after a roadshow that she went on in the fifties because Jill was very much she was a big star on the variety circuit back um, back in the day. And I could open your eyes was uh, was an act that she did um, with, with with various. Weird. Various songs and and uh, oh, sketches good. and things like that. Okay. So this this autobiography was written around 1970. It was her and her partner that wrote it, and it was about her very colourful life up till this point. And apparently, it ended with "Well, that's that." Um, little did she know that just around the corner was going to be her biggest role yet, Phyllis Pierce. Um, and I think. It's. I mean, you can't find very much about this autobiography online at all. I did a little Google search for it earlier, and I could only find things about this particular um, show that she was in. Um, but it wasn't. It wasn't printed, I believe, until after Jill had died in um, in ninety seven. I think it was, um, and it was very, very, very limited print. I don't think you could even buy it anywhere. It was literally right. just a chronicle of her life for her friends and family, and it was mostly made up of. Um, what was written with her and her uh, and a partner uh, in the seventies, with a little you know addendum on the end that said, "And here is what she did in Coronation See, Street." This is why I say, if I um, become uh, an eccentric millionaire, which is always the get the goal, um, 
I would definitely like to open or like start some kind of quarry archive or collection and gather all these materials together because I think some people have have got their own collections, haven't they, of things? But oh, yeah. wouldn't it be fabulous if you could? And I know ITV's got an archive and stuff, but I just really think that that some that feels like it's really missing. It's like having a like the mm. the British Library of Coronation Street. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so yeah, thank you again to Adam for for telling us a little bit about Phyllis and and giving us a few pages of this, and also to Mark Llewellyn who is um, well, he was on the podcast a couple of months ago, um, big curry super fan and aficionado, um, who um, lent him copies of the the autobiography as well because That's he great. was quite close to Jill Summers himself in the in the nineties, well, maybe eighties and nineties. I don't know. I don't even but think there's a te- anyway. I don't even think there's a television cultural history music there should be shouldn't there a museum mm. for just tv history absolutely should absolutely um oh, maybe so, that's my life's work with with that little Can somebody preamble me a fiver to get me started <laughs> i'm need? serious no not more than a fiver but you know what i mean we really we don't take our cultural history seriously in this country and um it is like a major cultural export as well as mm. being part of the history of us as a, a sort of group of people yeah. and the fact that you know phyllis pierce you know joel summers wrote this document uh document autobiography and um it's kind of lost don't you think that these are the sort of things that will get lost forever yeah eventually did we learn nothing from the lost doctor who episode did we learn nothing from demolishing coronation street yes no. no, we didn't. <laughs> right, Gemma, I'm going to leave it to you to um, run down Phyllis's vital Right, statistics. this is Phyllis's information. She was born on the 7th of February, oh, we just missed her birthday, 1921, oh, yeah. to Joshua and Violet Grimes. She's got a sister and five, five, five other siblings. Yeah, no, that was interesting because on in this autobiography pages, it said that Phyllis had 11 sisters. So who do we leave? Coropedia? Five siblings, autobiography, eleven sisters. I don't so, know. So, I don't think anybody on. knows or really cares. So, in her autobiography, it she... said that Phyllis had eleven sisters. But this wasn't written. This part of the autobiography, which is a biography written by oneself, was not written by her. Is that what you told me? You said it was an addendum. Yes. But was it written by her? I don't think so. So it's not an autobiography. That bit maybe not. <laughs> it's just a biography. She had lots of siblings, as people did back then. You know, the well, more you know, think about it, the more did. Phyllis reminds me of your Nan Lane, who was also a bit of a um, a flighty madam. <laughs> <laughs> carry on, carry on. Um, she was married to Harold Pierce in 1946, and she had a child, Margaret Whiteley, in mm-hmm. 1945. I know, scandalous. What, what happened there? <laughs> yeah. She first appeared on the 20th of September, 1982, vintage year, last appeared on the 1st oh, yeah, of no, May. She first, she, her first appearance on Coronation Street was literally two weeks before you were born. I know. And that was probably my due date because I was late. Oh, she was okay. like, better get on the telly to entertain the babs. I, mean, I was wondering how long it would take us to get into this episode before somebody tried to do a Phyllis Pierce impression oh, because she had much um, impersonated Coronation Street character. You know, I just can't do it. I think I need to like smoke another couple of thousand fags before I can you get mean, even what close. Do you mean another? Okay, how my first. Been <laughs> smoking down the let me just Let me just try. I mean, if you're going to impersonate Phyllis, there's only one line that you can really say, isn't there? Oh, Percy. Oh, that's quite grandly. Oh, oh Percy. <laughs> <laughs> Phyllis was never shown smoking on the street. Okay. I'm just saying, I'm just saying. Some people it's... just have naturally gravelly voices. Booming. I suppose if you're going to, you know, maybe if she, if she did all this musical stuff. In Might the, have uh, damaged her yeah. vocal cords. Yeah. She last appeared on the 1st of May, 1996. She was in 504 episodes. And as we mentioned, she was played by Jill Summers, who... First appeared in Coronation Street, 10 years before she would later arrive as um, Phyllis. She was in Corrie in 1972 as a Capricorn club cleaner called Bessie Proctor. Any relation to Graham? Perhaps. Four episodes. Um, Hilda was the head cleaner and Bessie refused to acknowledge her seniority. Which is yeah, no, I'd, I'd forgotten about this or maybe I didn't even know about it when we came to watch the episodes last year. 
we were just watching the Capricorn Club episodes in the early 70s and going, hang, hang on a minute, that's Phyllis, what's she doing there? I thought that she, but yeah, she, I, I had no idea that she played two roles in Coronation Street, so it's definitely worth Surprising. Hunting, hunting down if you're a fan, fan of the old summers. Surprising number of people have played more than one role on Coronation Street, including Lisa George. Oh yes, Lisa George, who we saw on uh, on the ITV3 classic, classic, classic Coronation Today Coronation from 1997. As of very young, fresh-faced. February just appeared. Yes. Yeah. Yes, as a nurse. Um, so anyway, yeah, that that was um, that was that was her first role in Coronation Street, and uh, they obviously liked her so much that they wrote yeah. her number down on a piece of paper, lost it for ten years, and then invited her back in nineteen eighty two, um, and this and her story. I mean, I don't think you can tell from um, Phyllis's first few episodes that she's going to go on to be such um, a beloved character, because um, she she just comes in as a bit of a. Uh, a bit of a crotchety old woman, doesn't she? She's she's. Um, it, it's when Chalky Whiteley, if you remember, was living in who's which house did he live in? I can't remember. Number seven, maybe, um, with Craig Whiteley, and they they ship those characters off pretty quickly. Um, oh no, it was number nine that they were living in, um, and because Craig Whiteley's dad Bob had gone off to join the navy, uh, mum was dead. And um, Chalky was Chalky was looking after him, and Phyllis doesn't reckon that Chalky's doing a very good job at all. Looking at him and says, "Oh, Craig, come and live with me." Chalky doesn't let that happen, so Phyllis decides to stay in Weatherfield to be near him. But alas, end of the year, um, Craig's dad Bob leaves the navy, comes and um, uh, comes and takes Craig away, and they go and move to Australia. So. Sad Phyllis times. Is so Phyllis, sad. Phyllis is very sad, and Phyllis is often remembered as a very funny, you know, comedic character, isn't she? She's there as a comic relief all the time. But there are times, a bit like Minnie Caldwell, I think, where when she, you know, when she gets the old hanky out and sobs, it really, yeah. really gets you, and it's like, oh, it's an old woman crying. So sad, so sad. Why did you miss out the beginning? I accidentally missed the beginning of Phyllis's bio, everybody. That's what happened in 1982. But what happened before 1982? She'd lived quite a life before then, Gemma. Quite the scandalous uh, flighty bird she was because she had a baby before she was even married to the girl's father. At least she does marry him in the end. A fellow naturalist. It's not a naturist. I know she was a bit of a randy bugger, but... She did keep thank her clothes you for, on, at least. Thank you for qualifying that for me, because I wasn't quite sure. His, <laughs> his name was Harold. He died in 1976. And in 1977, her child, Margaret, dies of cancer. Oh, this is tragic. Um, Because she had a lump, and Phyllis was like, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it, fine. And then she dies. So yeah. she feels guilty about this, um, and uh, literally for the rest of her life. And it, she talks to Des about it after Lisa dies in 1993 in Coronation Street, and just... Let's everybody know about that bit of her backstory. Oh, it's so sad. Isn't that is it? Uh, horrible. Yeah, I mean, when you think, yeah, Phyllis, she, in many ways, like, like I say, comedy character, but really, she was just like a lonely old lady, really. When, uh, and then this is the thing: so there's there's quite a lot of Cory characters who you know come across as as silly or or, or or light-hearted or whatever. You can have a laugh at them, but then when they you know, time it just right to tug at the old heartstrings. It can really be affecting, like like Raquel, for example. She's mm, yeah. laughing at her all the time. And then, you know, we just watched recently the episode where she gets set up by Tanya Pooley to go to the, the fake modelling shoot. Yeah. And then she, she comes back home and just is like, oh, Raquel, we love you. Right, 1983, um, she looks after um, Chalky when he goes down with the flu. Um, and then she finds out that her house in Omdurman Street is going to be demolished. So she wants to move in with Chalky, but he's like, I'm not having any of that. Um, I, I want to sell the house. Sorry. Phyllis tries to stop him. No good. So he, he sells the house and he's gone. Um, well, he, he ends up going to Australia as well, because lucky him, he wins £3.5,000 on the horses in August. Moves to Australia. Uh, Phyllis calls him a monster for abandoning her. And she's left all alone. But she buys a bungalow in Gorton Place. She does buy a bungalow. It's not, it's not like uh, she's got She's not nothing. out on the streets. No. But back in those days, you know, you could buy a house on a pensioner's wage. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. £50. Pounds. There you go. Yeah, done. £50 deposit. It's two bob a week. <laughs> yeah. Just go, go down the bingo. Get lucky on the bingo one night. Yeah, five, you can buy a house. Five bedroom house. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and that's kind of the... 
the beginning chapter of Phyllis that I think a lot of people forget about. I mean, Chalky Whiteley. Do you do you no. remember him? I do remember him, but because he was boring. He he was yeah. He was like a, a how long he was in this show for like a year or so. And I remember his face, but he's like, you you don't belong here. I could. There's some characters that just don't fit. You're you're like the character in League of Gentlemen. Yeah. You don't belong here. <laughs> but um. This is a local show for local people. But thank people. goodness we did have Chalky, because if we hadn't had Chalky, we wouldn't have had Phyllis. And um, and she goes on to have a... Well, the the, the, the main point of her being in the show was the pursuit of, of poor Percy Sugden, who'd also came in around about the same time. Um, and, and she starts... Um, she, she also gets a job washing up at Jim's Cafe as well, doesn't she? So she, she's always good for a gossip there with, uh, with Gail and Alma. And uh, and this is where Percy always used to go in for his toasted tea cake. I don't know why he didn't just find somewhere else to go. I there don't must, know why he no didn't toast eateries. his own tea cake. <laughs> he spent the whole war toasting tea cakes there under gunfire. Foods. So you get to Percy's age, you get someone else to do it for you. There were certain foods that I absolutely refused to eat in a restaurant or a cafe. And toasted tea cake is one of them. <laughs> There's nothing that you can be approved, improved upon. No, we by, do, by having someone else cook it for whenever you. Whenever we go out for meal, which, you know, hasn't happened so much recently, <laughs> Gemma does refuse to have anything that she thought she could make just as well herself. Yeah, what's the point? <laughs> right, 1985, Gemma, I will pass over to you. What does she get up to? She grabs Percy for a dance at the Valentine's Disco. Oh, Percy. Sort of thing that you would definitely invite your old people to. Um, and yes, definitely... the ladies excuse me, apparently, which is a thing. Gosh. I don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. Attracts the attention of Percy's bowls rival, who's called Sam Tyndall. But she's not really interested because all she cares about is uh, is lovely Percy. Yeah, Sam Tyndall was a bit of a wet blanket, really. He was another... He, he was just a nice, plain old... Just wanted a bit of affection, old man. I don't remember him having much of a personality, but there was... I mean, I think this is almost the closest that Phyllis got to a storyline, really, when it was a bit of a, a, a love triangle between her, uh, Percy and Sam. So she offers herself as a prize in the bowls tournament and Percy wins. I don't know why he uh, tried hard. Oh, the pride. I mean, he, course, he, yeah. he wasn't going to back down from a, competing in a bowls tournament just because he didn't like the prize. He wins. He refuses to take her on the bowls trip to Southport. So she gets her own ticket and comes along with somebody else. I don't know who it was. I, I, I think Sam goes. Yeah, I think Sam goes as well. Right. So Percy wins and then he invites his, his rival. No, they're just going there. They the are way both... this is written is there seems to be a bowls trip as a prize, okay? And no. there are two tickets and one of them has to be Phyllis's. Look, I don't know exactly what happened. And then he but wins I believe there and was he a bowls says, trip to Southport. I'd rather not take you. I'd rather take if I have to, Sam. I'd rather go with Sam than you. <laughs> and she goes... Fine, Percy, but I'm coming as well. And then they all go off on Look, to cut a long story short, they all go to Southport, they all go <laughs> yes, paddling in the sea. They go paddling. She, she steals a Susan socks, so they miss the coach back home. Yes. Sorry, I just stole your thunder there. Emily invites her for Christmas lunch, but she doesn't tell Percy until the day of, because he, she knows he will pitch a... Is he fit? It seemed like, you know, Phyllis got invited to various people's houses quite a lot at Christmas, didn't she? We oh, were... yeah, because she's like, oh, I'm on in, old lady. Oh, don't want to make any, don't want to make a fuss if it's just for me. Because we've seen quite a lot of the Christmas episodes. Oh, they yeah. always put it's them on the DVDs. Episode, yeah. there, there's definitely two or three that had Phyllis turning up at, uh, at number three and Percy being like, what's, what's she doing there? Yeah, I know. <laughs> oh, but inviting so people sweet. for Christmas. Oh, we're going to have to be, in, we're going to have to have people take pity on us when we're old and invite us round. Yeah, we are. Yeah. Maybe we'll be allowed to go around people's houses for Christmas by the time we reach that age. Um, she tries to win Sam back in 1986 because word spreads that back in the 50s, he, he had a bit of a big win on the pools, even more than Chalky Wiley. But then she finds out that he's gambled it all away and is penniless again. So she gives up and says, and, and she tells him, oh, so sorry, I just, I can't, can't just, just can't give up on Percy when actually the real reason is he hasn't got any money. Yeah, he's got no, not no dough, he's not worth it. She wears the same dress as Hilda at tea dance in big year, 1987. Big year for Phyllis in 1987. Seven, fashion yeah. faux pas. Um, she makes a play for Hilda's fella, Tom. I don't remember that. 
Because I a... guess that Stan's dead. I forgot when Stan he died. is dead. That Stan died in 84, I'm going to say. Yeah, I think so. Uh, in 1988, now Phyllis gets a bit nervous at this point. This is when Percy began living at number three with Emily. And Phyllis didn't like this. She doesn't like the idea that Phyllis is going to be living under Emily. the same roof. Hmm? What? Phyllis didn't like the idea that Percy is going to be living under the same roof as another woman. She And she has a, a stand-up row with Emily and accuses her of only being after Percy for his body. And, uh, He's a fine figure of a man, <laughs> Emily. I wouldn't blame you. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Um, so Percy, <laughs> by this time, I mean, he's, he's already had a chasing after him for a number of years at this point, and he tries to set her up with one of his friends, Arnold Swift, when they go on a coach trip to Blackpool. And actually, it seems to work quite well for Percy, because Arnold and Phyllis start dating for a little bit. Phyllis, Phyllis is absolutely thrilled to find out that Percy gets a little bit jealous of this, and then maybe he misses the attention a little bit. Uh. Um, and Arnold gets a bit annoyed at this, because he, rec- he, he tells Phyllis, look, you just using me to to, to flame him to, to yeah to get his you know get his juices flowing and, and everything and she's like no no it's not honestly not so they, they they end up dating for a little bit i think he just basically drops off the face of the earth by the end of um 1988 early 1989 but yeah she she that 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 was about it for that also in 1988, this is when Gina Seddon first came into the programme, who um, uh, obviously later returned recently, played by Connie Hyde. But she back then was working in the cafe as well with Gail. And Phyllis didn't like this. She didn't like the idea of somebody, you know, young blood muscling in on her cafe working job. So she uh, makes it her mission to make Gina's life an utter misery. Although she does, in the end, rein it in when Audrey warns her that if there's any funny business and if if Gail has to get rid of one of them, she's going to be keeping the young one rather than the doddery old grandma. That's discrimination. She can take her to court. 1989, when Alma gets to the cafe in her divorce settlement with Jim, she sacks Phyllis. Oh. I can't believe it. And um, so Phyllis just gives decides to spend all of her spare time in her retirement chasing Percy around a bit more. <laughs> Um, she hopes to be taken back on the cafe. Um, yeah, when Gail becomes a business partner, she's like, oh, Gail, can I have my job back, please? Um, and and Gail's she says like, no. no. Yeah, there's a really sweet scene, actually. I think it's from, from this time when um, Gail's like, oh, sorry, I, I can't give you a job anymore. And, um, and Phyllis breaks down. This is another one of those times where it's like, oh, you're so, you're so sad, Phyllis. And she's just like, oh, I can't remember what she says exactly. It's like sometimes I look in the mirror yeah. and... I say, who's this? Who's this looking back at me? I still feel young inside, and yeah. that's that's the thing with Phyllis, isn't she? She always is like you know, twenty year old trapped in a trapped in a sixty five, seventy five year old uh, woman's body. Everybody, Ooh. I think everybody feels like that. Um, but I think we all don't realise that we're getting older. But I will tell you that. I certainly do not feel like a young person when I hang around young people because they're all mad. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's such a sad thing. You need to, you need to um, hunt that clip down if you haven't seen it. She, she, Jill Summers is, puts on a fine performance there. And it is, it's just, yeah, about the, the tragedy of Being lost old. youth. Yeah. yeah, it's going to happen to all of us if you're lucky. Yeah. Um, 1990. So this is when she wins a trip to two for Holland. Um, and she goes to rush Ooh. to tell Percy because obviously he's going to be the one in her eyes that goes uh, with oh, her yeah, on this definitely. trip. Um, but <laughs> when she's rushing over to him, a shopping bag splits. A, all the, load, a whole load of shopping rolls along the street, including some apples, which Percy trips over, breaks his ankle. Um, and then he spends the next couple of weeks complaining about places not being wheelchair accessible. And then he probably never mentions it again once he... Probably not. No. So do they go to Holland? I don't know whether they go to Holland I'm afraid <laughs> they certainly didn't film any episodes there at least I can tell you that um this is there's also in 1990 and this is a funny scene that you can see on YouTube as well Phyllis tries to persuade Percy to go to a a, a life art class with her mm. and and she's like oh Percy you, there's it, you, there's women there and you know and they can they take their clothes off and you can you know draw them and he's like what do you think I am some kind of pervert <laughs> She's like, I wish. <laughs> yeah, she does. She goes along anyway, but, oh, so sad. Um, she she ends up working in the cafe again for a little bit in 1990 because Gail falls ill. 
But um, after she has a bit too much of an argy-bargy with Audrey, she ends up leaving the cafe, this time for good. Uh, end of 1990, this was a, this is really quite a sweet story, and I didn't find any reference to this on, on the Coropedia page on Phyllis, um, or in this autobiography, actually. But there was a, an episode or two where um, Phyllis gets sick, and Percy finds out about it and goes to look after her, which is just kind of sweet, because as much as he... He was infuriated by her always. They they they, they hung around. They really, they really had, had a bond, a, like a, a strange bond of like. Was it just because they were two pensioners living around a bunch of youngins, or you know what what was it? But it was um, in, endearing. It's one of those odd couple. Yeah, yeah, it things. was. I mean, uh, so much of the time it seemed that he couldn't. Yeah, you know, couldn't like wait to get away, get away from her. But hoping yeah, hoping one of them would die first, and he didn't really care which one it was, as long as there was sweet release. <laughs> so she, he, he goes and looks after her for a bit, and he ends up falling asleep in the chair next to her bed, I think. And um, he wakes up the next day and is pretty mad that she let him fall asleep, and even more so when she goes around telling everybody that Percy spent the night at her house. <laughs> Nineteen ninety one. She gets overexcited at the Better Buys trolley dash. That was a, that was a classic Phyllis episode, wasn't it? We watched that just recently when Reg and Curly are setting up this trolley dash, and um, it was just a load of old women that were there, just with their raffle tickets, wasn't yeah. it? And Phyllis is there, you know, front and centre, just saying, "Come on, go on with it. You know, she, go and get your kicks where you can." When she you're that age. Um, becomes the housekeeper for Des Barnes. Oh yeah, yeah. She gets a new who's job. Who's a yuppie? Yes. With um, what's her face, Steph, <laughs> um, and she's impressed by one of his gadgets, and she uses the ice cream maker, and she makes Picardi and peanut ice cream, mm. which sounds disgusting, and she also cleans for the Roberts, and she accuses Derek of molesting Steph, and it's all good. It's then just... she gets upset when Des and Steph split up. Yeah, all all, all go in ninety ninety one. I don't think anyone was really rooting for Des and Steph, were they? I don't. I, I don't know whether useless. people were. Steph was, yeah, not a particularly memorable character. Um, but the thing that there, there was a really, really sweet relationship between Phyllis and Des, and it kind of gave her somebody to look after because I think in many ways she did just want you know Percy to look after. She wanted. Yeah. She wanted, she wanted some company. Be... She wanted some well, some warmth. You don't forget that she's of a generation. And still, this happens to women where your only worth is kind of measured in how well you look after your family. And you know, she probably feels as though without a family to look after, she's kind of a bit floating in around with nothing to do. Yeah. So she she'd found her purpose. Late in life, cleaning up after Des Barnes, and um, and when you know when yeah when things went bad for him, that was her. Um, nineteen ninety two, she finds that Raquel is now living with Des. That's a bit of a shock oh, for her. Um, but when Steph returns, she takes Raquel's side when when Steph tries to get Why? back with him. Because Steph is a flighty madam, and she because Steph's end up lo- uh, using and leaving Des, doesn't she? And she's like, "Well, you 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 had your chance, lady. He's got a new woman now." It seemed to me like I didn't see a lot of Des and Steph, but it seemed to be a lot of Des expecting Steph to do everything for him. Yeah, <laughs> and then that just that role just got, got taken by it. Phyllis. Um, Phyllis becomes a babysitter to baby Tommy Duckworth later in the year as well, because um, Des and Lisa Duckworth get together. So that's quite sweet, mm. and she. Ends up the year being it does not. We'll find out about that in a minute. She ends up the year being better boys. Mother Christmas. Oh, lovely Mother Christmas. What do you want? What do you want for Christmas? Nineteen ninety three. She worries Des is going to get hurt again um, because of Lisa Duckworth because she might be a flighty madam as well. Yeah, yeah. But she does. She flies right into the, the <laughs> into the <laughs> part of the car and dies. Oh, tragic! She's devastated. Tragic. Um, she didn't let she didn't let it hold her back though. I mean, she does some exciting things like she enters a women's magazine competition on the Man in Your Life and wins a hundred pounds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, this, this is great. This this is hilarious. She, she wins this hundred pounds prize. And I guess she, she gets, nominates Percy. Yeah, she she does. She writes about Percy being the man in her life, and she has to. In order to claim the prize, she has to go on a photo session with him. So she has to persuade him to come along and get a, his picture taken with him. Obviously, he's got 
you know, no desire to do this. This reminds me of Mary I think he gets, Norris. It is a little bit like that, isn't it? He he reluctantly agrees. I think he gets cajoled a little bit by some of the other uh, residents. Well, of yeah, the hundred quid, hundred quid, uh, isn't it? He, he if... says, as long as you stay on your best behaviour, just try to didn't. grope me under the table, then I'll come along. And and Phyllis is just like proud as punch when she's there. She gets the fancy car and everything. And that's a lovely time. That, that's really really nice. She gets upset when Percy starts seeing and proposes to Olive. Mm-hmm. He was a, a local out. widower of, a, of um, one of his ex-army mates. He doesn't fancy him whatsoever. Does not, does not. But Phyllis still gets a bit Upset, nervous yeah. that she may have be has lost Might her lose dearest him. Percy. So she writes a poem and she wins twenty five pounds. Now we've got we've got this poem. This is a poetry competition. I, th- I think it's a brewery poetry competition. She writes her ode to Percy. Now I'll I don't know whether out. you want to read it, whether I want to, you but whoever it. does it, we have to read it in in Phyllis's voice. So I might need you. As if I'm going to start, you might need to take over. This is Phyllis's Ode to Percy. When God made Percy, he was smiling. He took two lusty arms and took two sturdy legs and he stuck them on the body of my darling. But I I think God was balmy as he made him join the army. When he cooked the meals for soldiers and nobody was bolder, he cooked curry under fire and became my heart's desire. I don't know what kind of form no, this poem is going. No I mean, there's logic. a bit of rhyming in here, but the the the, uh, the poem, cadence poetry. isn't. Poetry. Yeah. yeah. <coughs> oh, my, and this is certainly. Oh, you can do it. I can do this. He's got a bird called Randy, and he's not the only one. <laughs> that doesn't even rhyme. He's always got a smile, and if he wants to, I'd run a mile. And if he wants to buy me flowers, he can do it any day. And if he wants to misbehave with me, I won't stand in his way. Right. <laughs> I, I think that's me done for ones, this episode. What now. the other ones in that competition were like? Um, there was a poem from Derek about Mavis, which talked about her dowdy breasts. Dowdy? Yes, and I don't think Mavis was particularly um, impressed by that. Don't ever use the word dowdy for anything. <laughs> Not to describe your wife or any part of her anatomy. No. 1994, she was off screen for most of the year, but she came back at Christmas and there's a great line when she says to Percy, are you going to kiss me under this mistletoe? And he says, I wouldn't kiss you under anaesthetic. <laughs> that's like, I think that's one of my favourite Percy Phyllis. You know, yeah. Two handers or whatever. Just a, that's, a, that's a fantastic anyway. line, considering that she was only in for two, two or three episodes in 1994 because Jill Summers was, this is around this time where she was sadly going through some real health issues and she had to be away from the street. But she came back and delivered that absolute zinger with Percy. <laughs> Absolutely loved this. 1995, um, she ends up catching um, Steve and Vicky having a shower in number six together. Um, and they managed to buy her silence with a bit of alcohol. I know the way to her heart. Um, and uh, again, sadness, mid-1995, she realises that she can't really cope. She's a bit too old to be a cleaner. She ends up going to see Des one day to, to give his house a good bottoming and finds that he's already kind of done it for her because he thinks that she's getting a bit past it and thinks he's, he's going to help her out mm. by tidying for her. And she's like, yeah, you know what, I can't do this anymore. So back to retirement again. Um, and then one of the last things that she does that year, and we are getting so close to the end of her time on the street now, it's so sad. She um, accosts the Red Wreck Flasher, which was um, Reg Holdsworth exit storyline, actually, where he gets accused of being this flasher. Um, and she manages to save his bacon by um, when, when, the, when the flasher um, flashes her, she ends up beating him with her handbag and then he gets arrested and uh, Reg is released. It's revealed that it's not Reg. It is not Reg, although that is the sort of thing, you know, you think he might do. In 1996, she thinks Alex in when Maud reads her teacups and discovers that the man of her dreams is coming into her life. But unfortunately for Phyllis, <laughs> Maud had mixed the cups up. Um, when Phyllis proposes to t- Percy, she is turned down yeah and that's basically the last that we see of uh, of phyllis because um mid-1996 there's a story with some of the oldies um to do with the uh retirement home which is going to be renamed from mayfield court it's going to be renamed alfred roberts court and that gets um percy's uh and all the other all the other wrinklies in Weatherfield, it gets them uh, their backs right up. So they have a protest in front of the Weatherfield Town Hall. And uh, this new character called Lily Dempsey basically had to be invented to fill Phyllis's role because they were going to have 
the two of them protesting together and um and trying to stop them renaming the old people's home but yeah jill summers at this point was too sick she couldn't come back to corrie so didn't get the chance didn't mm. didn't get it's it's really sad when these characters don't get to have a goodbye isn't it and it happens to you know a fair few of the of the old guard on coronation street that say well i'm gonna I'm going to be in this job till I drop, basically. I know, this is the thing about, you know, sometimes we criticise stories or say, like, oh, why did they do that? That's really weird. They should have done it this way. Or why wasn't so-and-so here at that time or whatever? And it's like, sometimes it's because they keep hiring biological people to to play (laughs) in these roles, these actors. They're human beings and they uh, get sick. They just do robots. And have uh, dramas of their own and can't come in work um and so things have to be hastily rewritten or things changed at the last minute yeah oh poor phyllis or phyllis i i thought she was such a wonderful character she was she was so warm and and funny and uh like we said earlier not at all in the same mold as so many other of the old women on the street because you know there's people like Audrey, who's also old, but I don't, I don't really think of Audrey as being an old woman. She's well, just Audrey. And, and she, you know, she's perennially in her, you know, 30s or 40s, it feels like. Um, but when you get the old, she, she looks like a grandma, doesn't she, Phyllis? And when you picture the other grandma looking women like Blanche and Sylvia and Evelyn, they're all made to be battle axes and, and nasty and acerbic. And Phyllis wasn't like that. She could get as she could give as good as she as she got in in any argument, but she was primarily there for for the comedy, for for chasing after Percy. And she was she was just lovely, wasn't she? I think if there was anybody on Coronation Street, if you said to me, one of the characters was secretly on drugs the whole time, I I would say it was Phyllis. <laughs> Why? Where'd you get that she just from? Just chilled out. She didn't care. She was she was chilled out. I, I mean, yeah. She, she had the munchies for Percy. <laughs> yes, that's very, very true. I, I just loved her. I love her. And I, and I kind of think that there's a real gap in Coronation Street now for somebody like that. We don't like have that. a Randy Grandma on We don't Corey have a Randy Gran, no. And I think that it's um, unfair to characterise older women as being sexless lumps of um, curly hair and wrinkles. I think, I think this is a... It, it's a shame because... Yeah... Uh, it's almost like there's there's no room in Coronation Street for characters that are just there as Fun. extra flavour. Yeah, I, mean, I know. Like, people like Moira, yeah, where they yeah, just very come in like and they Moira, just, like, actually. chuck them a plot once and then go, let's not do that again. Let's just have them come in and observe everybody else. I could almost imagine Moira growing up to be Phyllis, Oh, my you know. God. Maybe she's Phyllis's long lost grandchild because oh, yes. unbeknownst to her, her daughter That's Margaret secretly had a baby when, when Phyllis wasn't looking. That would be amazing. Yeah. Yeah. Um so I mean I, I guess I guess maybe she's a bit like Kirk in that she's just there for comet relief. Except I think sometimes nowadays when they have characters that are mostly just there for the comedy the the their idea of comedy is let's get them acting stupid. Or well, yeah, yeah. Let's make a f- let's make them say a, a line where they've misunderstood something. Yeah, it is. And Phyllis was never like that, was she? It she was wasn't more dumb. She was situational comedy. Yeah, than... F- Philip was a uh, Philip. <laughs> Phyllis <laughs> was you know as sharp as a tack. She was very switched on. She knew everything that was going on. You couldn't get anything past her. No. Um, and yeah, she she didn't come across as as dumb at all. And and I think Cory would do well to to look back if they're trying to make you know, truly funny characters now and think, well, we can laugh at more than just, here's a, here's a silly old... Yeah, they've got to be careful because a lot of the... Donut. Yeah, a lot of the time it's thick, people being thick or people being sarcastic and rude. And those are the, like, the two main categories of comedy in Coronation Street. I mean, even, like, Emma and Gemma and, like, say, Kirk and... Yeah. They all fall under the, just, I'm a bit thick and I don't get what's happening. Yeah. And then you've got people like Evelyn and David, who are and Moira, just sarcastic and rude mm. people. But um, it'd be it'd be more fun, uh, I guess. You know, yeah, and people like Brian, just buffoon buffoonery. Mm. Mm. I don't know. I'm right. sure there there's there's still some great comedy on Corey. 
Yeah. You yeah. don't appreciate it at the time. And then when you look back, you're like, oh, that was great. Why mm. didn't I say how great it was at the time? Also thinking about, you know, could could we have a character I suppose like... if you think about, like, Jenny, Jenny junk acting, that's a good example of, like, a comedy yeah. just being in there that's character-driven and is not... Yeah, but J- Jenny's not just there as a comic relief, is no, she? No, that's, no. that's a facet yeah, to her yeah, character. Yeah. But for, for those characters comedy. that are mostly just there for comic relief, they do sometimes lean a bit too heavily on the let's just make them say stupid things that maybe people in real life wouldn't actually say. I was also wondering, you know, saying that we don't have really character like Phyllis now, and I'm wondering, like, is Curry too much of a, you know, a, a machine for for the elderly actors and actresses to get on board on now? Because back then, you know, you had two episodes a week going on to three by uh, the end of, uh, of Jill's run on You're the programme. saying program. it doesn't facilitate the addition of older no, you, you got, I think you've got to have a lot of energy. Physical. It's very, very full on. Although, I mean, saying that, you do you do have some actors well, who William go through Rose long... Well, William complain about he it. He doesn't. You get some act- actors who go through very long stints of not being on at all, but... That's the thing, Michael. And, you know, back in the day, you'd only be on two episodes a week anyway. So if you're in two episodes a week now... Mm. And I also don't know, I mean... The, if you're if you're in it and you're in a big story, a big issue story, you, we know you're in it. You're in, you know, first thing in the morning. You go home really late, and you're. It's like you you are in the machine, and you work all the time, and you end up going through the ringer and getting exhausted and needing time off. But um, back in the day, you know, they would have rehearsed and stuff, and maybe yeah. the work would have been sort of you know a bit bit more bit more work back then than now if you had only have two episodes a week, you know? Yeah, yeah, maybe. Because maybe. They, they, they spent... They did not not work. They they just did... did yeah, they did more behind-the-scenes stuff that we don't seem to get. Yeah. So um, uh, what's been, as we said earlier in, in this podcast, um, Phyllis has been a, a fairly new character to you. You've not had much call to to watch her or see scenes with her up until last year when we were watching the old ones you you have i've seen you chuckling along have you have you quite <laughs> taken to phyllis yeah she's brilliant i love her i i, do, I like um i like what female characters that are a bit break the mold a little bit because you know but i think Corey is good at that in general i think that there are very few characters like iconic ones where you can go oh yeah that's just their version of so and so but really phyllis was just um a category all of her own there's nobody else no. like her i don't think there ever has been or ever will be again i don't know i'd love it i if mean they honestly would. Mo- moira now you mention her really is the closest <laughs> yeah. i would say that we've got well, to she's, phyllis she's who's just much, some much randy younger. randy woman who's you know slobbering over every every man that she, you know comes her way uh, except well, unfortunately, with phyllis, obviously the only person there, there is a like, slight yeah. misogynistic edge to the joke th- that really the point of the joke is that she is inherently undesirable because of her age and appearance. Yeah. So, you know, and and, this, and a similar, I guess, I don't know whether they're going with that, for that with Moira because she's certainly a very good looking lady. Mm. Um, but I think, I think that the joke with Moira is a bit more that she's so full on that she just kind of scares people away. She is, she's so desperate. Like, yeah, exactly. And men aren't used to <laughs> women just going, come on, boys. Yeah, <laughs> they're yeah. like, well, I know, what's the catch? <laughs> Uh, with with Phyllis as well, she, it was like, oh, oh, oh. she only had kind of had one thing, didn't she? Yet she was able to make that one gag work again so and again it, it and was, again. And it was also endearing. Never has Phyllis come onto a, uh, into a come scene and, me, and, right? and I, no, not yet, I'm too young for it. <laughs> Never has Phyllis come into a scene, you know, gone after Percy and me go, oh, here we go, I'm going after Percy again. Well, Watch. I'm sure people at the time, some, sorry. Oh, oh that's a good yawn. No, I mean some of them might have thought it was tedious, but I've never found it tedious. And um, she's just got that sparkle in her eye, hasn't energy, she? And energy. It's like uh, if she didn't have that kind of like randiness for for Percy, she might have died long since. Mm. And it, it is. <laughs> I, I don't think the character would have worked without Percy. Well, no, it, it was such a brilliant it. double act, and and, um, and uh, Bill Waddington, who about. played Percy, was a, a great comic performer. Yeah. He was he was a comic, you know, back in back in the day, back Lots in war times I mean, as well. This and... is the generation of actors in Corrie that don't don't really exist anymore, where they came up 
in the music halls mm. and they were performing during the war and they were like real proper all round entertainers who came from the theatre before television was really, you know, an affordable thing. So people would go to yeah, local theatre and pa- patronise the theatre a bit more. And there was, seems like, I don't know, it feels like perhaps it might have been a bit more of a vibrant scene then. Yeah. And those people have kind of moved on to different, you know, the, the people that would have done that sort of stuff are mm. either in telly or on YouTube or whatever, doing their own stuff. But they really were a generation of quite admirable, yeah. like real and hard grafting, properly dedicated. Not that people, I'm not saying that people don't work hard now, but, you know, there's something their, really... Their whole life was entertainment. And they're so talented. Yeah, I mean, Bill uh, and as you Percy only, played... And you only see, like, the, the tip of the iceberg of what they are, what they are do, what they could do in, mm. in Corrie. Because by the time they got to Corrie, a lot of these actors this is like the final role they ever they ever do you know mm. or they they don't they don't go on to many other things yeah. but um or they retire into Corrie yeah yeah a bit especially build. in the in the 80s and the 90s because that generation was sort of becoming older yeah he he played the straight man in that comedy duo so well and it was yes. you, you could have, I mean you could have had a Percy and Phyllis sitcom really I yeah they, they were just uh, on, online spin-off if if they were still in it nowadays, See, this is the just, sort of just thing. perfect, and and his reactions to her and uh, oh, I I just just love them. But it 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 does feel like she's she's kind of been forgotten. It's it's bizarre. She she very rarely appears on the clip shows. Um, yeah, she's where I can't. Remember, you haven't written this down, but I don't know where she came in. The... I have written this down. She came twenty seventh in the ultimate curry. Wikipedia fan survey well, which is not super bad. high it's not it, it, that's really high what are you moaning about she's she's been forgotten she I think 27 she, I don't I think if you are if you to ask many people like who are some classic Corrie characters in the 80s 90s I don't know whether Phyllis would get a mention but then when you say ah but what about Phyllis that's when people say I've, I love Phyllis she but was also, hilarious I, but it's, there's also a certain element of if you ask hardcore Corrie fans they're going to know who Phyllis is. If you just yeah. got 100 people off the street and said, name me 100 Corrie characters mm. in order of how good they are, yeah, they probably d- wouldn't get past 20. <laughs> very, very true. Um, you, you were saying earlier about um, uh, about Jill's past on, in the musicals and everything, and, and I did want to talk a little bit about her crazy life that she had before coming into Corrie, because I mean, she, the fact that she'd done her autobiography by, you know, the 70s, she she had lived a life, and I, and I do hope one day to be able to, to read this, but um, she was not born Jill Summers, Gemma, she was born on a Margaret Russell Santoy Fuller. That is a crazy... That is a showbiz proper... name. I love also, I love the name Honour as a first name for, yeah, a, for a woman. Um, yeah, she she was born to a, a family of travelling showmen. So oh, literally, so she was she was a born. When you tell showman. me her name was Honor Margaret Roselle Santori Fuller, I think heir to a kind no. of you know like a gizmo fortune. No, no, or she, like tea sellers. No, she she was literally she was she yeah was born on on a stage. She was born on and, a cart on the way to the stage and had her first role. The day she was born. Yeah, yeah I do. <laughs> and um, she she took her name Jill Summers from her favourite measure of alcohol. I, I, I don't know whether it's pronounced a Jill or a Gill, but that, that's a quarter of a pint. I don't believe and her. Her favourite time of year was summer, so that is where Jill Summers came from. I'm gonna measure. I'm gonna guess that this Jill yeah. measurement, quarter of a pint, was not measuring beer. I for it to be her favourite, it's probably a, a quarter of a pint of gin <laughs> or vodka. Um, she ended up touring the halls with a singing act in World War Two with her half brother. Um, although, Scandal. I know. Uh, <laughs> but when um, she found he he uh, fell ill one time and she had to take over the accounts and she realised that she discovered that he'd been uh, taken uh, the lion's share of all the profits from their Scandal. act. Scandal. So she ends up going solo. What a bastard. And it was also around this time where she moved into comedy. She was on stage one day and she tripped over and um, came out with some rather um, inappropriate language, which the audience lapped up. Probably back in the day, like, just hearing a woman swear was hilarious. Yeah. Although, if this was in the World War Two, this would have been pro- primarily... If she was touring... Where's she touring? Britain or...? Uh, oh, I don't know, actually. Because it depends on where you were. Like, if she was... 
touring Britain, she might have been performing to other women. No, she was performing to men at this point. Oh, um, right. Yeah, so so she realizes that they people like her when she tells dirty jokes and swears, which is basically of they do. how That's she perfect. then went. That that was her. That was her act. That was her thing after this. Um, what <laughs> being a very earth, being a very jokes. rude old late well she wasn't old at that point right. um, but she yeah she ends up joining the working men's club scene uh, where, and, and did theatres and everything oh, and, I wish um, I could, she could tell me her best jokes a- apparently she ended up getting quite a few complaints because she was too rude for the men in the working clubs and that just must give you some idea how blue these acts were but um, yeah, she 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 went on TV in the fifties. She had a, her own show called Summers Here. She played the London Palladium. Oh, where's all this? She is this she had a. Anywhere? I don't I don't know whether it is. I don't know whether it'll I've be, seen it. It will be in my Coronation Street Museum opening, twenty twenty nine. It's one of these things like you know Betty Driver, yeah, and you I think know. of her as being you know frumpy old this Betty on Coronation Street, but she had this important. fantastic, amazing showbiz life on the stage back in the war i honestly think we don't realize with the passing of time how we how entertainment changes and we forget like like we we like stands up used to be way more on telly than it is now and Mm. like used to have um more family like variety shows with people playing games we forget about that Mm. and you know this generation of people that have nearly all gone now would have been entertained by people like this yeah and it's it affects the way that you um a dying art indeed well it is a dying art and we should preserve it we should be preserving these things i'm sure there is a museum that does it but i, try, I tried to have a look and i couldn't really mm. really mm. see but um to me it just feels like it's like ephemera and i you know i've got a fascination with that yeah yeah i, I do um, so that's basically it. That is that is the colourful life of Jill Summers and indeed Phyllis Pierce, the, the <laughs> Randy grandma. Sounds like. Um, who will go down in our hearts as a, a really wonderful, classic Corrie character. Just going to prove you don't need to have huge stories to... You do, you really don't. To have a place in, in the Corrie fan's heart. You just need to be a, a, a warm, loving funny really really funny character be paired up with the right person and um mm-hmm. and and the curry fans will just lap you up i was gonna say it sounds like there's a lot of um influence from actually jill summer yeah in, in uh phyllis with I, I think there dirty, is dirty naughty lady yeah <laughs> it's just funny watching you know because you all think of these old women well, as just being thing. sweet it's old like grandmas and she, isn't yeah. it? and uh you know, it does does come from a, pl- a slightly problematic place, but you can't. You have to laugh about it because it it's so unexpected. Well, it's, it reminds me a bit of um, Margot Bryant, who played Minnie Caldwell as well, who apparently you know used to swear like a navvy back. You know, when the cameras start filming. Well, the, 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 this just proves to me that the stereotypes that kind of um, put women in boxes really i don't know where they came from because a lot of the time you hear about it and they're like no nope, that's not what we were like really yeah totally right i think we should end this uh character profile with a little voice clip that's been sent in from adam bleeds we mentioned him at the top of the program and it's thanks um, to him that we've been able to Phyllis get so super much fan. Of this. Uh, Phyllis and pierce is adam's number one cory character of all time yeah. so I, I, I texted him a couple I of think... days ago and said would you like to come on the podcast to tell us a little bit about why you love Phyllis so much and he jumped at the chance so um he, he sent us in a little voice clip um and so we're going to play it now um to, to show you just why adam likes Phyllis so much so conversation street exclusive here's dirk talking Hi everybody, it's Adam Bleaves here, otherwise known as Dirt Not Kirk, Weatherfield's finest storm and extraordinaire. Now, I hope you're enjoying this week's character profile because the minute I knew that Gemma and Michael were going to be covering Philly's pace, I just had to get in touch and share some love for the wonderful Phyllis and the actress that played her, the late Jill Summers. Now, I first became aware of Phyllis when I was about, I'd say, eight years old and I'd be in the lounge and mum and dad would be watching the street and there would be this really sweet older lady on the screen and there she was with the blue rinse and you could hear that gravelly tone in amongst that strong Lancashire accent. And there was just something about her that when you saw her on screen, there was just this instant gratification. It was like she was everybody's grandma and you just wanted to give her a great big hug. Now, there was obviously the 
great amounts of humour that she brought to the show and to the character in her relentless pursuit of Percy Sugden, but also some of her outrageous flirtations with some of the other younger male residents of Weatherfield, whether that be Kevin or Martin, or of course, later on, Des Barnes. She was forever at home behind that counter in the cafe, and then, obviously, later on, she cleaning for Des, she was able to care in a sort of maternal role for him, and, you know, although it did come across as gossipy sometimes, I do have this belief that it was just because well, Phyllis was a lonely old lady and she just wanted to be loved and in return love and care for other people. So obviously fast forward many years and I was fortunate enough to meet Coronation Street historian Mr Mark Llewellyn and he actually obtained a copy of uh, Jill Summers' autobiography for me and Jill wrote it herself with her late husband up until her career in the early 70s but it's a fascinating read and the character and the actress that portrayed her, the two together have just, I don't know, discovering more about both. They just make me want to love Phyllis and Jill even more. Now, I just want to read you a very quick excerpt from an address that was given by Roy Barraclough at the funeral of Jill in 97. And he states that her performance as Phyllis, of course, has become a street classic but it's for her performance off screen in the green room that she'll be most remembered by the other cast. She loved to be party to all the day's goings on and would sit in the middle of the green room watching both doors so that no one could pass through unnoticed. I just think that's kind of wonderful because you've got Phyllis Pierce and you've got Jill Summers and the character traits are so similar both not wanting to miss out on absolutely anything that was going on in the relevant community, but also just because the character and the actress had such care and compassion and such love for the people that were around her. I just think she was a great comedy actress and she brought so much to the character and that is why, for me, Phyllis Pierce is completely up there as number one Coronation Street character for me. Thank you and see you soon. Bye. Oh, thank you, Adam. Wasn't thank that lovely? You. I'm so glad that I asked him to be part of this because yeah. uh, the, the the passion and the, the yes. love that he has for, for Phyllis is obvious. And I, I, like I said, I, I don't think Phyllis often gets remembered as, as, a, as a classic character. I don't think she's at the top of many people's lists. Um, so it's really lovely to hear from Adam speaking with, with such love and affection yes. for her. her. Oh, yeah, definitely. And, and it just makes me go, oh, yeah, she was lovely, wasn't she? Yeah. She was she was fantastic. Oh, she's and, still and in it when we're watching it. I know, she she but is still here for a little bit. Is, is, uh, yeah, time is... Soon. is, is, is but the, thing about, short. the nice thing about Coronation Street is that even when your time is over, you can go back and watch again. Yeah, yeah. Oh. She's going to live on forever. Yeah. Uh, barking after Percy. <laughs> <laughs> right, um, I think we'd better call this a day now. We've been talking for about an hour about for, for Phyllis Pierce. Um, thank you everybody uh, for listening and if you've also got just as fond memories of watching Phyllis as Adam does and, and as we are you know, currently mm. um, accumulating ourselves by watching some of our older episodes, do write in and, and tell us what it is about her that you liked. I know if you get any uh, stories about um, any favourite Phyllis bits or I don't know any ideas about how we can get the Pierce family back on the show somehow <laughs> do write in and let us know um, but I think with that we'll call it a day so thank you everybody again um, that is it so, you say, so bye Gemma bye you're going to say goodbye in Phyllis's voice goodbye to our chocks <laughs>